Hello everyone, my name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are ext extremely fortunate to be able to listen to Dr. Laurie Michley, who will be talking to us about what do successful people do to slow down PD progression, which is hard to find a more relevant topic, to be frank. Dr. Michley is a naturopathic physician and researcher specializing in the treatment and management of Parkinson's disease. With over 20 years of experience in the field, she has become one of the world's leading experts in the use of natural therapies for Parkinson's. As you mentioned in the invitation to this session, I hope you have all, like me, generated a pro-PD report before the presentation. So for those of you who are watching a recorded version of this session, the pro-PD app has been designed as a tool for assessing and tracking, tracking symptoms of severity over time. It is freely available on the iOS and Android app stores, and more details are listed in the description of this video. Doing the pro -PD, using the pro -PD app before the, the video recording or during the video would help you get a better understanding of what you're going to be discussing tonight. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and ed education purposes only. So if you're seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, you should consult a medical professional. There will be time for questions at the end of this presentation. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat for questions, use the Q&A function. So for those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is managed by Mark Lambert and myself with the aim of sharing Parkinson's expertise. We aim to help you and frankly, to motivate you to become well-informed journalists in your condition in order to make informed choices on how to adapt your lifestyle to slow down disease progression. We are organizing Zoom sessions like today's with researchers and PD specialists to update you on the latest advances in science and medicine, nutrition, exercise, and wellness. We post the recordings of our sessions on YouTube and Spotify, and we also post short videos on TikTok and Instagram. Details are available in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, as well as on our brand new website, nosilverbullet4pd.com. But let's come back to today's topic and to Laurie, who will be talking to us about what do successful people do to slow down PD progression. Laurie, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle and Mark, for the invitation to be here today. Let me share my screen. Oops. Are you seeing what you're supposed to be seeing? Perfect. Great. All right. So today's talk is about my search to help you all find the recipe for success. And what I'm talking about are what are the choices, habits, and circumstances of the individuals who have your diagnosis who are doing the best over time? I have a couple disclosures. I'm going to be touching on most of these. I work at Seattle Integrative Medicine. I do research at University of Washington and Bastyr. I have research funding from Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, I run online Parkinson's school and camp and a dog detection thing and the app, as we already talked about. So my goals here for today are truly to upend your entire concept of Parkinson's. If I can do anything today, it is to have every single one of you leave a little more convinced than you started that this disease is modifiable. I want to change your perspective and truly break down this old outdated paradigm I think many of you are walking away with. I love chat GPT, and it was really fun to ask chat GPT about the history of the saying, no silver bullet. Um, and I learned all about the werewolf legend and needing a silver bullet to take out werewolves um, at a certain point in history. And so I really kind of wanted to cling to this idea that no silver bullet implies there is no quick and easy fix for a complex issue like Parkinson's disease. Something this complicated and diverse and far reaching is likely to have a very simple, easy solution. Be warned of things like snake oil, right? So let's hold on to this concept for a minute because I also think it's really important to learn from history. So we had a period in history where there was essentially an epidemic among some people more than others of a disease called scurvy. People literally bled to death. All of their connective tissue began to break down. It started with fatigue and easy bruising, but it very quickly went to bleeding gums and you know, you'd bump somebody and their skin would break open. If you had your appendix removed, the old appendix scars would pop back open. If you fractured your tibia, 
when you were a teenager, that, that healed bone came unhealed. People literally bled internally until they died. Two million people died of scurvy. And as people died, I mean, think about that. Sailors predicted a 50% death rate when they loaded up their boats. That's mind blowing. When you read history, there were some hints about what was going on. Quote, there seemed to be a general acceptance among seafarers that fresh produce was helpful, though no one knew why. In 1953, they, the, a ship got stranded in the St. Lawrence River and a tea made by Native Americans stopped the sailors from dying. They had record, but it took years for people to listen. And eventually, after a couple false starts, we actually did learn that you could cure scurvy with limes. And for 200 years, as long as we have known about Parkinson's, for 200 years, we cured scurvy with limes before we discovered ascorbic acid. And what I'm here to argue is that we have been trapped in a paradigm where a researcher can't get their study funded until they first discover ascorbic acid. The funders are essentially saying, you come to me with the answer and the mechanism of action and the proposed mechanism by which you think limes might be helpful, and then we will consider funding your lime study. And what I'm here to say is I think we're going about it wrong. I think our priorities have been messed up. We're asking the wrong questions. And if limes work, I don't care why they work. Let's use limes, right? So that's my quest. Are there simple, easy answers right in front of us that seem to be working that we could be using whether or not we understand them? So the questions I have for the group here, is ascorbic acid a silver bullet for scurvy? Is niacin a silver bullet for pellagra? Iodine for cretinism? Thiamine for beriberi? I would argue that nutritional deficiency syndromes are complex problems with very simple solutions. So epidemiology is the study of populations. It is essentially learning how to ask the right question in the right way to get the answer that the community most wants to know. Traditional epidemiologists study what does it take to get Parkinson's disease. Clinical epi starts the day of diagnosis and asks, what are the people doing that are affecting or impacting rate of progression moving forward? There have been a lot of studies. We have decades of day traditional epi studies. What was kind of new was to bring that forward and start to look from the point of diagnosis forward. Are there things that are, people are doing that impact rate once you're diagnosed? So the concept is super simple. This is a very diverse disease. Every one of these green dots is a real person with Parkinson's and the blue line that you see running through the center is the average rate of Parkinson's disease progression in our study cohort. At diagnosis, most people have a score of 550 and it gets worse at about 40 points per year. What I set out to do is to use the diversity of the cohort to my advantage. Let me look at those people who are doing an amazing job. 20 years into Parkinson's disease, they're calling their quality of life excellent. Who are those people and what are they doing differently than the people in really rough shape in the first five years? So before I dive in, I just wanna say, it's not just about the red pill or the blue pill, or is it broccoli or is it the cauliflower? This isn't just about what to take. One of the problems that we have been running into for the last couple hundred years is we're asking the question wrong. These downstream late stage symptoms like tremor and rigidity are a distraction, right? This is a metabolic disease with neurological consequences. There is this community bias that the more expensive and invasive and technologically driven, the more it's real medicine, right? Physicians and researchers also have to confront our own biases if we're going to jump, get over this hurdle. Most docs have not been trained in nutritional medicine. I think the average MD gets about four hours of nutrition education in their entire medical school curriculum. 
right? So if they're not learning about the role, I mean, nutrition is the study of what does a human body need to get from our environment in order to survive and thrive? I can't make vitamin C. I need to get it from my environment. So the study of nutrition is what does a human being need to source in order to thrive? And if conventional medicine is only devoting a couple hours to that topic in a five-year medical school curriculum, your doctor isn't being trained in nutritional medicine, and that's not the right person to ask, right? So we're in this loop. Over on the left, you know, I have a hard time studying Parkinson's disease prevention because we have no way to get to people early. Even if we could get to people early, we don't have a way to slow disease progression. And even if we had a way to slow progression, we don't actually have a way to measure slope. And so we are caught in this circle where until we do one, we can't do the other. And it doesn't make sense to do one without the others. So what I started to do is just chipping away at all of them on my own. I have been working on a way, better way for tracking, a better way for screening, and it, some strategies for disease modification. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Foundation, the definition of Parkinson's is changing in real time. When I started working with Parkinson's 20 years ago, the concept of Parkinson's was what you see in the center, the elderly man with the hunched posture. With Ray Chaudhry introducing the concept of non-motor Parkinson's disease, with rock steady boxing, with, there is a whole world exploding of as as people get die more and more people are being diagnosed younger and younger this is in my career i've watched the shift from an old people disease to a midlife disease how do we maintain our health and our youthfulness and our vitality with parkinsons that wasn't the state of the world 20 years ago so when we ask physicians to describe Parkinson's, they say rigidity, slowness, tremor, stooped posture. When we ask patients to describe Parkinson's, fatigue, impaired handwriting, loss of smell, cognitive problems, muscle pain, sleep problems, I'm not even sure that we're studying the right disease. I'm not sure that physicians are working to help you with the same problems that you have. What you all are telling us this disease is, is not what the researchers are focused on. According to our scale, about two thirds of most people's symptoms are non-motor each step of the way. Obviously it's, this has a lot to do with how we've set up the scale, but this is what we see when we look at our data over time. And my clinical experience is that each one of you is dealing with something a little bit different. This is essentially like whack-a-mole. You get new symptoms, you go to the dog and try and hide them, right? And it's just one comes up, you fix it, you know, and your whole life is defensive. And what I would like to encourage all of you to do is play a stronger offensive game. Imagine you have been put in charge of the offensive line of your team. The conventional approach to Parkinson's plays amazing defense. You have an amazing goalie. You have an amazing defensive line. We can hide your symptoms really, really well. Where the community has failed miserably is offense. And you are the person who is responsible for changing that. You cannot wait for your physician. You cannot wait for the researchers. We are at your employ. You are in the driver's seat and you are coming to us to ask our advice. It's totally up to you whether or not you take it. So what I set out to do is find a universally acceptable goal. How can I make everybody happy? What scale could we use for measuring Parkinson's disease severity that would be universally acceptable? And what I went with is fewest possible symptoms, highest possible quality of life for as long as possible. And each one of you, some of you are going to want to play with your grandkids. Some of you are going to, you know, want to work long enough to be able to retire by your little cabin in the woods. Some of you, every one of you has your own little things you're after. But those top three, I think we can argue are probably universally acceptable. I am going to argue that it is really, really, really important to quantify your symptoms. It's not enough to say you're tired. You need to let your physician know how tired are you for a whole bunch of reasons. They need to know how important this is, how severe this is, and 
How in the world are you going to know if you're trending towards better or worse if you don't give it, assign it a numerical value? So we're not going to get into this. This is a statistical thing, but it's it's the concept that everything I'm about to talk to hinges on. And it's something that is kind of mind blowing that this has escaped our community for so long, but it's a statistical thing. When you are measuring a scale, the sensitivity of a scale, what we're talking about is the ability to detect true differences in a population. How well does a scale do that? So there are bi binary questions, true false. There are ordinal scales on a scale of zero to four. How bad is your handwriting? But continuous outcome measures where you have something like this slider bar, you get a more accurate result. It is more sensitive to change. You are less susceptible to bias. You have profoundly greater statistical power when you use a con continuous scale. Whether or not researchers or physicians end up using the one that I built is totally up to them, but I am absolutely sure that to get the level of sensitivity we're after, they're going to have to use a continuous scale. It's not, I, I believe we are at 20 some phase three double blind placebo controlled trials have been conducted on therapeutics that worked in Petri dishes and test tubes and rodent models in phase one and phase two trials, but failed in phase three trials. And at some point we have to ask, are we really that bad at choosing therapeutics or could we be using scales that aren't sensitive enough to detect what we're looking for? So basically I worked backwards. I knew what I needed was a continuous scale. I knew it needed to have motor and non-motor symptoms. I knew it had to have be sensitive early in the disease. I knew it had to reflect the patient experience because a doctor can't see your pain and insomnia and constipation and fatigue. Um, and so here's what we came up with. We list 35 common symptoms with part of Parkinson's and ask you to estimate on average over the last seven days, how severe have any of these symptoms been? If you have not had any dyskinesia, and dyskinesia has not been a problem in your life, you slide the tab all the way to the left. If your tremor has been ugh, about three quarters of the week, I have been frustrated with this tremor. You slide it about three quarters of the way over to the right. And you go according to your standards and rate on average this week, how bothersome have any of these symptoms been? And what you can see is the average rate of Parkinson's progression over time. So I do want to draw some attention. So we have validated this. We have a formal validation paper under review right now, and we have already previously published um, data showing that this scale correlates with traditional outcome measures, but there is a better validation study coming out. This is the ongoing study. It's called Modifiable Variables in Parkinson's Disease. And the scale that I built was to get this study done. The whole reason I built that scale in the first place was because this is a study I wanted to do. What are the successful people doing differently than the people are progressing like average? Who are those people in the green circle? What choices are they making that the people in the red circle are not making and vice versa? Just a little word of um, perspective here. You might not like the taste of the medicine. This isn't my opinion. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm not here to sell you on an idea. It's not like I have some concept of what I want you all to be eating. I'm just the messenger. The only thing I did was I went out, I surveyed 3000 people with Parkinson's and I asked, who are you, how are you and what are you doing? And I promised myself that I would not filter anything, just be the messenger, give you the wrong data. Um, just a little note on how I use this in my clinic. Every one of you can generate your own Parkinson's report, but I do set goals with my patients. Before I see start my clinic day, I show up an hour early and I pull the reports of every single person on my schedule for the day. 
Before the day starts, I know when I'm worried about Betty's constipation and Steve's sleep and Bob's fatigue. And it has improved my quality of care so much to be able to see what kind of trajectory each person is working, moving on. Here's just a little close up of what that looks like and how I treat people differently. That person in the top left, who's more than twice as severe as other people diagnosed eight years ago, as opposed to the person on the top right, half is symptomatic. I don't worry about the person on the top right. Why are you here? You've got this figured out, go. You know, the person on the left needs my attention. This is personalized medicine. It is insane that this is not routine. So this is what a ProPD report looks like. Like I said, they're free, iOS, Android. I'm not making money off of this. Um, we have people already using it in 121 different countries. Um, so that is super exciting. Okay, so back to you and how I want you to use this. I want every one of you to choose a dot. Set a goal. Some of my patients will look at this and get really competitive and determined and say, I'm going to be a dot you've never seen before. I'm going to be 35 years with this disease in the green zone. You watch, right? And then there are other people who are like, you know what? If it means I can cheat and have french fries once in a while, blue zone's good enough. Right? So you all have to decide how bad do you want it? How long do you plan on living with this disease? And how hard are you willing to work for it? We'll get into the therapeutics in a minute. The point of this slide is I just want to show you that the earlier you get started, the better. And so my goal in for myself in my clinical practice is I want every single one of my patients to make it to their 100th birthday with a pro PD score less than a thousand. I want you to live until 100 years old with your quality of life, good or excellent. So if you were to be diagnosed at the age of 50, this is how much you would have to reduce your slope of progression to meet that goal compared to average. And you know what I will say is 50 years ago, when a person was diagnosed with Parkinson's, the average, on average, they died within eight years. I would argue we have already had as much, as much improvement as you would need to meet the goal I'm proposing is how much improvement we've already had in the last 50 years. This is attainable. This is doable. And if you get to it early, you can really slack. You know what, if we can get to your kids and your loved ones before they get a diagnosis and also start to implement some of these disease modification therapies, they can live an excellent quality of life with Parkinson's for a very, very long time. So getting to it early is a really big part of this. So here's just a slide that shows the earlier, the same amount of improvement matter, makes a much bigger more relevant difference, the earlier you can start. Okay, so let's just look at how we use the scale in clinic. First of all, epidemi epidemiologically, uh, we have 439 people who, when they joined the study, were not on medication, dopamine-based meds. Over the course of their participation in this study, they started levodopa. When they went from not on meds to starting meds, there was an improvement in pro-PD scores. Specifically, the symptom that got the best, that improved the most after starting levodopa was not tremor, it was not slowness, it was not rigidity, it was anxiety and muscle pain. We talk about levodopa like it's only for motor symptoms. Our data actually suggests non-motor symptoms improve with levodopa as well. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, in terms of what else can we, is this scale able to detect? Up top, you will see the more exercise a person does, the more days per week of exercise a person does, the fewer symptoms they have over time. People who say true to the statement, I am lonely. Being lonely is worse for you than seven days a week of exercise is good for you. Yeah, how easy is it to go play table tennis with a friend, play pickleball with a friend, go to rock steady boxing, dance for Parkinson's. You can feed two birds with the same seed. 
right? If you exercise with friends, ching, 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 points, points, points. Let's start thinking about this. And I don't think this is um, bad data. I mean, there is a lot of research that suggests loneliness is detrimental to health. Alcoholics Anonymous, I think, is a beautiful template to use. There, there, there has been research about there's something about the community coming together that is actually therapeutic. Um, here you can see these are called radar charts. The bigger the maple leaf looking thing in the center, the more symptomatic a person is. And so on the left, the, the thin line out on the edge shows the average symptom severity of lonely people with Parkinson's disease versus people who say false, I am not lonely. They are about half as symptomatic. And you can see which symptoms are most important, motivation, initiative, apathy, depression, anxiety, sleep, fatigue, sexual dysfunction, much worse among lonely people. Over on the right, you can see the first two days a week of exercise don't matter much. People in the orange line, people who do one to two days a week of exercise are not actually any better off than the people who don't do any. The improvement starts with the gray line when you get to three to five days a week. And it's even better for the yellow line when you get to six to seven. More seems to be better. We just published a paper a couple months ago comparing the Mediterranean diet to the MIND diet. This is the spread in the population, pretty nice even spread. What we showed was the MIND diet was about twice as good as the Mediterranean diet in terms of being associated with better Parkinson's outcomes. For those who need a reminder, uh, the MIND diet is basically uh, a combination of a Mediterranean diet and a DASH diet. But instead of just saying vegetables, it specifically emphasizes green leafy vegetables instead of just fruit. It emphasizes berries, um, nuts and seeds. The, the thing to keep in mind about the MIND diet is it does include poultry, but according to our data, when we analyzed each of these variables by themselves, poultry was still associated with faster Parkinson's progression. This, the MIND diet would have been better had it not included poultry. So I tell people, if you're looking for a cookbook, go buy a MIND diet cookbook, but go light on the poultry. I'm not going to go through all of this. This paper is online, freely available. Um, but this over here is a list of the symptoms that got statistically significantly better as one's adherence to the MIND and Mediterranean diet improved. So what we're looking at is go over to the MIND column, all of to the right of the MIND column, all of those P values less than 0 0.001 were statistically significant. So as people began adhering to more and more of a mind-like diet, constipation improved, motivation, depression, apathy, the daytime sleepiness, visual disturbances, insomnia, muscle pain, cognition, sexual dysfunction, and urinary symptoms all got better as people became more adherent to a mind to diet. In terms of diet, I think we can still do better. I think there's the Mediterranean diet is good. Mind diet is even better. And I think we can come up with an even better Parkinson's specific diet. And that's what I have been working on. So what I have been handing out to other people in the past are a list of foods associated with the people who are doing best. On the left are the foods that the people who are doing the best are eating. And on the right, you'll see these are be food behaviors that they say true to. I avoid soda true. I regularly eat buckwheat, true. I avoid dairy, true, right? So this is what I have been doing. But what, and I've been trying, you know, all these different font size, the larger the font size, the more of the effect size, trying to find a way to communicate to people, not all good is equally good, not all bad is equally bad. How can I educate you all about what the data are saying? And it starts to look like this, right? I can see that the people who are doing the best are eating those foods on the bottom right. I can see the people doing the worst are eating those foods on the top left. What is really exciting is as of this morning, I got this list of foods. 
And this is something that I've never released publicly before. Um, but what we are doing here is on this slide, I am asking, what are the successful people eating? On this slide, we are saying, when you take it into consideration the fact that people who eat beef also eat a lot of pork and people who eat a lot of fresh food also eat vegetables. The lists over on the right are, if we're gonna use the highest standards, taking into account multiple comparisons, what are the foods that really seem to be responsible for the prevention of progression and the acceleration of prevention? If we are going to attribute some level of causation to diet, this is the closest list I've ever been able to come up with. So um, we can come back to that after, but ultimately this is what I am trying to set up. I'd actually like the next version of the app to be able to help you all get a handle of not only where you're at, but where you're headed. There's no reason you can't answer a couple of questions about your physical activity, your diet, your supplements, your friendships, and have the calculator predict, hey, you keep this kind of behavior up, do 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 this is what you can expect for progression over the next 10 years. So we are working on ways to, to statistically not just tell you that Brussels sprouts are associated with better outcomes, but to help you be able to see how you change your diet and we can see a improvement in your trajectory moving forward. We are working really hard on all these different ways to package and deliver lifestyle modification. It is so much harder than red pill, blue pill, right? I mean, this is even harder than like a half hour on the treadmill or an hour on the treadmill, right? We Not only do we not have placebo diet, I mean, we are talking about empowerment and change in mindset and change in values and change in bedtimes. And, you know, it is, it is not just about a food or a supplement. It is about an approach to your journey with Parkinson's disease. And that is not an easy thing to prescribe. So when I work with my patients in clinic, I kind of have this idea that Parkinsonism is just a boat with some cracks in the bottom. And our job is to metabolically take inventory of where are the threats to your progression and seal them up. We're not going to get into it today, but in clinic, it's not just diet. Yes, I nag about exercise. And yes, I tell people to change their diet. And yes, I tell them to go to bed early and get a good night's sleep. But I also do a very comprehensive part, panel of labs with each person. I work every single new patient I see. I work them up for B12 deficiency, lithium deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, inflammation. And so it's not as simple as just one thing. But I do want to let you know that when I nag about exercise and diet and social health and bedtimes, and I do rule out B12 deficiencies, we start to see some clinic trends, right? And before I show you the screen, I want to acknowledge that it is really bad, low quality data, right? But I just showed you on many of the slides prior how Parkinson's progression increases over time. So I have a biased sample. Every single one of my patients who winds up in my office has looked in their, office, their neurologist's eyes and thought to themselves, I'm going to find somebody who knows something you don't. Right? That is a very empowered group of people. That is not the average patient right? who second guesses their neurologist and says, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to find someone who knows something else. Right? The fact that they're paying cash for my visits probably means they are in a, above the average income threshold. And the patients who I did see who are getting horrible results are probably not likely to come back, right? So there are a whole bunch of reasons that it is not high quality, good data for me to say, look at what I see in my practice. However, for a disease that most of you have been told is irreversible and progressive, this was one day of patients in my practice. Some of these people I've been following since 2016, Even if it's a skewed sample, even if I'm full of placebo, even if I don't know if it's exercise or diet or what it is, I, I 
and becoming more and more convinced each month that this disease does not need to be irreversible and progressive. I have, I, I see it every single day. I see people who are better today than they were a year or two or three ago. With meds, with exercise, with dietary modification, with supplements, with correcting their underlying deficiencies and decreasing their inflammation. I believe this disease does not need to progress. So as I've been plugging away at solutions, it's not just about disease modification and tracking. I'm also very interested in screening. I'm excited about the, we don't use smell tests enough. I'm really excited about skin biopsies. Most of us have read that Fox Foundation recently um, has been part of a, a biomarker in cerebral spinal fluid that might prove to be useful. I have trained Italian truffle hunting dogs um, to identify the scent of Parkinson's disease in dirty Q-tips, earwax. And so they, I put dirty cotton swabs with earwax and skin cells in these little containers and the dogs go up and down the track. It's a cheap, 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 easy way. Dogs are an order of magnitude better than any technology humans have. And they're available today. It took me four days to train my Italian truffle hunting dogs to identify the scent of Parkinson's. What I'm saying is we have tools we aren't using, right? If we all came together, we can find ways right now to tell you whether or not your loved ones without Parkinson's are going to be diagnosed in the next couple of years, right? We do have ways to slow it. And we certainly have ways to track it now. So for those of you who would like to pitch in, you like the concept, you like the idea, I believe in big data. The more people who can participate in this study, the more the results are truly reflective of the general population. Right now we have 90% white people, 80% of people from North America. We need more diversity. We need geographic diversity, ethnic diversity, racial diversity. If you want these data to reflect you, you need to participate and people like you need to participate. So to participate in this study, it's completely internet-based. It takes about 60 to 90 minutes twice a year and you can do it for 15 minutes, save it and come back. So you don't have to do it all at once. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And this is an email address that you can reach me at if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Laurie. This is uh, really a message of hope for all of us. And I think that uh, when you said that actually um, we are the boss, I think this is an important thing. We are in charge, we are in the driving seat and uh, we can make choices, choices to exercise or not to exercise, to eat different things, to make an effort to boost our social lives or to stay alone. Um, and, uh, and I think that you showed us what people who are successful at managing their symptoms do. So you gave us a few hints, more than hints, indication of what the best choices might be. So thank you for that. Let's just look at some of the questions. Let's just start with Donna. Donna has two questions actually that are referring to the fact that uh, the geographical uh, differences. The first geographical difference she's highlighting is a Mediterranean country. And she's asking whether we have noticed that people in Mediterranean countries that have a Mediterranean diet by definition uh, have significantly, significantly less Parkinson's than others. Oh, we don't have registries in any of those countries and certainly not comparing them between countries. So we don't know. We've never looked. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess that answers the second question from Donna, who was asking whether in China, where people have followed Eastern medicine practices, we have seen a different type of uh, situation than, than in other countries, but we probably don't know. Um, I mean, they have different data than we do. For instance, they have data that says um, people who drink more than three cups of green tea per day while they're growing up mm -hmm. develop Parkinson's seven years later than their counterparts. And so, you know, obviously each culture has their, we don't have enough people drinking green tea in our data set to be able to have that be statistically significant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Beatrice has a, a few questions. The first one is about chicken. She was surprised to see chicken on your on your list of uh, less well, less good foods. Uh, why is poultry bad? Is, is it something related to well, so, th so this is the whole difference between pragmatic and explanative research, mm. right? This is the difference between limes and vitamin C. 
I don't know why chicken's bad. I don't frankly care why chicken's bad. All I want to know is the once I know that the people who are doing worse are eating more chicken, what yes. I want to know is if you all stop eating chicken, do you start doing better? And we might someday find out why, yeah. but I'm going to skip over the whys and just go to, would you be better if you started behaving like the people with your disease who aren't progressing? The two other questions from, from Beatrice are about two other uh, elements. Uh, the first one is gluten. I mean, I understand what you said about chicken, but uh, did, you, did you look at gluten in a different way? Because you didn't mention gluten at all today. And mm -hmm. I personally, for instance, have a gluten-free diet, which is part of my, my Mediterranean efforts. Um, on this slide, you can see on the behaviors over on the right hand slide at seven o'clock position, people who say true to the statement, I only consume gluten free bread and bread products are doing better than people who say false to that. I see. Um, on the left, you'll see brown rice, uh, oats, not many other grains. Um, none of the grains made the cut for statistical significance at all. Uh, in, in all of the data, wheat pasta has always either been insignificant or just barely significant in the bad list. Um, yes. So I have, it, it's either neutral or maybe a little bad, but there's nothing about bread and pasta that seems to be good for you. Let's, let's just stay on that, that chart for a second, if you don't mind, yeah. Laurie, because Beatrice, the next question was, so also my question is about wine. Mm -hmm. Wine is on the green list, which is really encouraging because I wouldn't expect anything like that to, to be the case. Uh, you may not have looked at wine, but have you, do you have any feeling about white wine, red wine, wine? Red is, wine better, be better? Red, is, red is better than white. Yes. That's the most common question I've gotten in the last 10 years of this stuff. <laughs> From people who had stopped drinking. Red or, well, as soon as I say wine is good, everyone's hand goes up. Red or white. Exactly. Good. Let's just move, move to a question from Edward. Edward is asking whether it would not be more precise to assess symptoms without the modifying effect of medication. Um, let me stop sharing here. Not necessarily, um, because at the end of the day, I want to study the people that I'm trying to help. Mm. And the people, one, it's unethical, right? Like if you're just newly diagnosed in the last year or two, maybe we could take you off meds for a bit, but to truly get you off meds, to really, truly evaluate you in an off state, truly, we're talking about a one month washout. Yes. That might be doable for someone very, very, very early in the disease. And, and I would actually argue that L-DOPA is a nutritional deficiency. Just the way that people with insulin di to dependent diabetes can't make enough insulin and they have to supply it exogenously. And once they put the insulin in, everything works normally. People with Parkinson's can't make enough dopamine. Once you put the dopamine in, everything works normally. I would actually argue there will never be a disease modifying therapy that doesn't include making sure that your dopamine needs are met. That's part of the therapeutic package. I think you're answering another question actually from someone on the, the same topic who basically was asking, does using uh, levodopa, carbidopa, levodopa today reduce your odds of healing in the future? Now, we're not exactly talking about healing anyway, but uh, is it basically, is it bad for you in the long run? I am talking about healing and no, it's not <laughs> bad in the long run. Um, in fact, I would argue, yeah, no, I, and, and on the online Parkinson's school, there's an entire class. It's free. It's online. It's course number two, and it's called, it, it's all about dopamine management. And the whole point of that course is to uh, me trying to kind of make the people with a little bit of medication hesitancy comfortable. Thank you very much. Sarah is asking whether stress could affect the way food is digested and impact the effect of, of the diet. Absolutely. 100%. Yep. The um, fight or flight or rest and digest. It's one yeah. or the other, the, the teeter totter of the autonomic nervous system. If you are experiencing stress, fight or flight, you, it is not possible to rest or digest. Mm. So Stephen, who is a, a, an old friend of ours, uh, is asking, he's an MD, he's asking how important is rest in PD, especially for people who feel fatigue? That's a good question. I haven't studied it. Um, other researchers have shown that sleep is one of the 
few modifiable variables that seems to bode well for progression. Um, so I, I, the research on, so Parkinson's disease is very much mechanistically attributed to something called impaired autophagy. Y'all are doing a really bad job taking out the trash. Inside your cells, there's a whole bunch of metabolic waste. When my daughter was eight, she said, you mean their neurons are constipated, <laughs> right? That's exactly what's happening. You're not taking out the trash. And the term for that is impaired autophagy. And at night while you sleep, there is a 17 fold increase in your brain's ability to take out the trash. The other thing y'all should know is you can't take out the trash without lithium. My master's work is on lithium deficiency and Parkinson's disease. There have been researchers screaming for 30 years, this new book on lithium deficiency and Parkinson's disease. There have been researchers for decades saying lithium deficiency is associated with neurodegenerative and psychiatric diseases. And it's taken 40 years, 50 years now. I, yes. No one seems to be responding or, or stepping up from a public health perspective to change that. There still is a lot of work to be done. My, my neurologist, who I had a consultation with a few days ago, mentioned exercise for me for the first time, and I was almost falling off my chair. <laughs> so uh, someone is asking whether Parkies or people with Parkinson's uh, should eat fish every day. I didn't know that you need it every day. Um, I don't know what labs you all have available. I met, and once a year, I measure my patients' omega-3 fatty acid levels in their blood. And there is data that says people who are 4% DHA, long chain fish oil, are half as likely to get dementia. Mm. So what I do is I have my patient, most of my patients take supplemental fish oil and they don't need to eat fish daily. Um, but that at the end of the day, my recommendation is personalized to based on their blood levels. Good. Um, someone is basically saying that you didn't really, I, I mean, you touched on the topic of supplements, but you didn't delve into the detail too much and you didn't mention vitamins or coenzymes or others. Um, is it, uh, did I miss something or, or is it something that actually is deliberate? No, um, can of worms basically, but let me do that right now. So this paper is freely available. We just published it two months ago. This is the answer key as far as we know. It's called Symptom Severity and Use of Nutraceuticals. And if you go to the figures, these are the supplements that are most commonly used in Parkinson's. They are not the ones that are most effective. This is what is most commonly used. When we look at the ones that are um, I think we have 40 some different supplements on here. And so what we did is for each one of these supplements, we adjusted, we compared each person to other people, their age, their gender in their income bracket diagnosed the same time as them. And so the way to read these data goes like this of the 1100 people that we surveyed, the 19 people who are taking ginkgo which is not very many, are on average doing 357 pro-PD points better than the people not taking ginkgo. And the black line tells us how confident are we in these data. If we were to go out in the true population, we can predict that the true answer is somewhere between here and here. So if we call something statistically significant, we are talking about the blue line not only looking beneficial, but the black line being to the left of middle. So intranasal glutathione is good, but we can't be confident that this is true across the population. Oral glutathione is even better and our confidence is really high. And so each one, this is not a shopping list. Some of you, if you have had breast cancer or prostate cancer, you could actually hurt yourself with DHEA. You know, in the United States, this is a cheap over-the-counter supplement. In Australia, you have to see an endocrinologist and get a special prescription for it. So each one of you are going to have to decide with your doctors, with your, who, whoever is guiding you, whether or not you should consider taking some of these. Um, but you can see down here, um, 
Oh, look at some lion's mane seems to be good, but not terribly confident. Uh, low dose naltrexone, NAC. A lot of people take NAC as uh, in hopes to boost glutathione. NAC does not seem to be working. Glutathione does. Vitamin D might be helping bones. It might be helping something, but it's not slowing progression is what our data says. So this is just interesting. It's hard to say, you know, anything about red light therapy. We only have not 35 people using it. I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The stuff that's down here doesn't mean it's not working. It probably means we don't have enough data or it's not working. And so this is why it's so important for all of you to participate. But something like probiotics, hundreds of you are using probiotics. They're not slowing progression. If they help your constipation, great, use them. But our data suggests they are not doing diddly squat to slow progression. So when we have hundreds of people doing something, I am much more comfortable interpreting it differently than if we have six people doing something. So this is a supplement data and where you can find it. That's amazing. Thank you very much. I will just uh, jump into a couple of uh, specific questions on supplements as we are on that topic now. Uh, I think Mark was asking about uh, berberine. I don't know if it's something you have an opinion on. I didn't see no. it on your list. No mm -hmm. opinion on that. Uh, we have two people asking about mucuna. Yeah, so inter I find it super interesting that levodopa does, is not associated with improved outcome over time, but mucuna is. And there could be a couple of reasons for that. Um, people whose disease is mild enough to be managed with Makuna are already doing better. You know, it, it's there's going to be a self-selection bias there. Um, the other thing is there was a very neat study done in Canada where they took the dopa out of Makuna and people still benefited. And so Makuna has NADH in it and CoQ10 in it. And there, there are a lot of things in Makuna above and beyond levodopa and probably some antioxidants and anti-inflammatory things. And so, um, but I do find it interesting that Makuna did make it to the list of things, supplements that were statistically significantly associated with better outcomes over time. That's very nice. Uh, there is a question from an anonymous attendee who was struggling to find the ProPD app. So just to repeat, it's, it is on the iOS uh, web store and on the Apple store, the Apple. Uh, yep. It's, yep, yeah, and cool. it's, um, it's called Parkinson Symptom Tracking. Perfect. No, it should, yeah, if you just type up Parkinson, it should pop right up, but Parkinson Symptom Tracking, no S. Have you looked, that is a question as well from an anonymous attendee, have you looked at the effect of chemicals such as hair dyes, makeup, etc.? cetera? Uh, I mean, I know that some of the environmental factors play a big part in the agriculture, for instance, or in the, in the industry but in the ones we're using at home in particular? Um, we do ask people, do you dye or color your hair? We have not analyzed those data to see if they're associated with worse progression or not, but we are collecting those data. We are collecting some environmental data that again, we have not analyzed yet. How close do you live to the nearest highway? Do you have a history of exposure to pesticides, herbicides, things like that? Um, so if there's a grad student on the call who's looking for a project, we have a <laughs> bucket ton of data. So Armin is asking a couple of things. Uh, he's asking whether reducing protein is good, and if so, by what proportion? And he's got the same question about reducing sugar. Um, so our data does not suggest sugar is really that bad for you. Um, but patients will often report feeling better when they get the sugar out, the brain fog, mm -hmm. tremor. I, I hear it a lot in clinic, but it doesn't match what our data says. In terms of protein, um, you know, we kind of have two groups of people in the cohort. There are people who are really underestimating how much protein interferes with their meds. So for those of you who don't know, the receptors in your intestinal tract that allow you to absorb dietary protein are the same receptors that absorb levodopa. So your first protein containing meal of the day starts binding those receptors and that's less space for your meds to go. It is so common that people will have two eggs for breakfast and a turkey sandwich for lunch and go years thinking that their meds don't work very well. And then when you save pro, and then there's something called a protein redistribution diet where you don't reduce the amount of protein. You just change the timing. You save your protein for dinner, have a low protein breakfast, a low protein lunch. And so you kind of give your medication first dibs 
at the receptors all day long. Meds work great. You run your errands, you go play tennis, you go to work, and then you come home and have your fish or salmon or eggs or whatever your protein you're going to have at night. So you don't get protein deficient, but, but you don't have to worry about that interaction. You're still probably going to be more rigid and stiff after dinner, right? And that's, we can deal with that separately. So we have a whole group of people who are probably listening to this, who have never been taught that something as simple as an egg can ruin their entire day in terms of med responsiveness. The other group of people have been taught that and they're so paranoid about combining drugs and protein that they're essentially making themselves protein malnourished. And that's not helping anybody's anything. And so again, once a year, I measure all of my patients' protein levels, albumin, globulin. There are ways in your bloodstream to assess protein. And we both, um, you want to, your, your protein requirements, you want one milligram per kilogram body weight. That's your total protein goal don't want much more than that. And you don't want much less than that. That's about the ballpark each of you are going for. A study was just published out of Greece, I believe recently that said the average person with Parkinson's and their spouse are eating 50% more protein than the average, than the typical non-Parkinson's household. There's something about where am I going to get my protein? Where am I going to get my protein that you guys are chasing protein a little bit more than average? So if we're going to go by that study, you might want to loosen up a little bit on your protein intake. And what the study said was for every additional 10 grams of protein, the person consumed their dopamine requirement had to go therefore go up now to overcome the protein. So many of you are caught in that cycle. That is very important to know. Um, you touched on when you showed us the chart of the supplements that were working according to the survey or not. Uh, you, I remember probiotics were not very high on the list and uh, someone is asking whether probiotics are good for PD and if they do interact with levodopa. I, I mean, I what you showed there was quite a, an insignificant trend. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, there is no question that the microbiome in Parkinson's disease is abnormal. Right, we, we know that. And we, we have another paper under review right now that we looked at 50 consecutive patients with Parkinson's disease. And I think on average, each person had about 5.7 million unique organisms, not just bacteria, but fungus and, and um, what do you call the viruses that live inside the bacteria. I mean, you know, there, there's a whole world in there. And so it is such a joke to think that you're going to put like four or five strains of a bacteria in a capsule and shift five to 7 million organisms milieu. If you want to change your microbiome, change your diet, mm. right? Like there's no probi fecal transplants might be a shortcut, but if you go back to cheeseburgers and milkshakes, what grows in your gut is a reflection of what you're feeding your gut, the organisms that are in there. That's an important message. Tony is basically saying he's looking at the green list of food and um, he's worried he wouldn't really feel full on that diet. Um, and he's asking whether uh, there is a way to sort of like make you give you that feeling of being full while at the same time focusing on the green list and not on going, going on, the, on the red list. Yeah, so... Um... Feeling full comes from really two different strategies. Getting enough food to stretch your stretch receptors gives you a sense of fullness and getting enough fat in your bloodstream to chemically send a signal to your brain that says I'm sated, right? So the short answer is just increasing the amount of fat in your diet. Coconut oil was on that list. Olive oil is on the list, right? So, so satiety can come by increasing fat content. And I do think it's important to, there's no question that, how can I say, animal products take six to eight times longer to move through your intestinal tract than plant foods, right? And that does require a little bit of reset, right? It is harder. You're eating more and more often if it's going through you that much quicker. But let me tell you, I spend my entire life listening to people complain that things aren't going through you quick enough, right? Like you have to, so many people equate full from this lump of stuff sitting in my gut for six hours means I'm, I'm like, I'm not hungry because it's just sitting there being undigested. 
that's exactly what we're trying to fix. I want you to be hungry. I want you. And, and so quantity matters. Um, smoothies, sm I can't eat as many fruits and vegetables as you need to get the points that I want you to get. My morning breakfast, you know, I'll put little macadamia nut milk in the bottom of a blender with a handful of spinach, a banana or two, some fresh blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, frozen black cherries, a little peanut butter, scoop of chocolate powder. I mean, that's a 25, you know, the points, points, points. I get half of my fresh fruits and vegetables as a smoothie for breakfast in the morning. So cheat, find ways to make it easy to get lots and lots of food in an easy to digest way. Exactly. Smoothie is the best time of the morning. Um, someone is asking about dairy products and saying, should we avoid all of them? Cheese, milk, yogurt? I mean, I, I will add to that question with uh, some, some comments I had heard in the past that some type of cheese like Parmesan or hard cheese would be different from some others. Is it all dairy products? Uh, I, I have friends that tell me menthol cigarettes are different than non-menthol because the studies have never been done on menthol. Um, I've been paged with people said, what about camel milk? Um, so the answer is if you want to look for a loophole, you know, you're welcome to jump around. Um, this is the page that I told you I am most excited about. This is the brand new hot off the press data set. This is the closest I have ever gotten to blaming. If there are, is a short list of foods before what I showed you were the things that successful people eat. This is a list of Scientifically speaking, where are the fish really biting by way of shaping progression? And you're right, the list of bad foods is way longer than the list of good. You can't just eat the good. I expect you to eat some things that aren't on the list. That's when we can go over to the brown rice and the teff and the eggs and the wine. It does not look like wine is slowing Parkinson's progression, but successful people do drink wine. So, so if there is really a short and sweet version of the list, a take home that you're going to, those of you who are open to some dietary modification, this is where I would put my energy. The most important good foods to eat are those ones that are on the bottom. If you're going to emphasize more of anything, that's what you load up on. If you are going to start avoiding foods that look like they are probably hurting, this is the important list to start avoiding. And for the person who asked about dairy, every study, except one out of Japan, but every study for the last 30 years that has asked, is there something in our environment that might be causing Parkinson's, has said pesticides and dairy products. That is not disagreed on. We are, we're arguing about why, some people think it, think it's the pesticides in the dairy. Some people think that dairy changes the microbiome. Some people think it depletes uric acid. Some people, so we don't know why, but we all agree. The more dairy your children are consuming right now, the more likely they are to be diagnosed with Parkinson's. Why we don't have prevention efforts underway? Why have we not told the next generation to stop consuming dairy? I don't know. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a comment to the audience. We have answered uh, slightly more than 20 questions, and I see we have another 24 questions open. <laughs> um, I think we'd be lucky if we managed to do all. Uh, so I would just basically suggest to everyone at this stage that please maybe refrain from adding more questions, knowing that um, I might not be able, I would probably not be able to, to go through them with Laurie. And uh, Laurie, thank you for your time. You're very generous with your time, but we, we, we have to, to cap it at some point. Rosemary, <laughs> Rosemary is telling us that she's been fighting being overweight all her life and she has avoided high calorie foods, alcohol and fats. And she's basically asking whether the uh, mind diet can be balanced with the risk of gaining more weight. So oh, words, is, is mind a ri at risk of, of, of basically destroying her, her plans of managing her weight? No, first of all, um, it's possible to eat a mind diet that doesn't include alcohol. Nobody's going to force you to start drinking. You can still get a lot of mind points and leave off the alcohol. Um, and not all fat is bad fat, right? Um, remember, 80% of your brain is, is fat. I mean, the reason fat is so important is that's what our brain is made out of. And so 
try not to think of fat as good or bad, but something the body needs. And it is your job to feed your body good fats, the long chain fatty omega-3 fatty acids, plant polyunsaturated fatty acids, and try and avoid fried fats, animal fats, saturated fats that come from animal products. So it's fat isn't bad. It's the type of fat. Nobody exactly. ever gained, got, became overweight eating too much olive oil. <laughs> That's right. That's a good memory to keep. Uh, Annie is asking whether you have any changes to your opinion on vitamins B1. So I don't know what your opinion is on vitamins B1. I know some people take high doses of vitamin B1. What is your opinion, please? Um, so I, um, when, when, even before the Italian paper was published, I was always fascinated by the overlap between, between some thiamine deficiency symptoms and Parkinson's. So um, I do think it is biologically plausible that a subset of people might benefit. When people in my clinic have asked for it, I have helped them and I have personally never been impressed with anything I have seen personally. In the study, 55 people said they were using high-dose thiamine. Interestingly enough, I think it missed statistical significance by one point. I mean, this really does look like it's doing something. I, I get that it didn't officially make the cut, but these results made me have more enthusiasm for high-dose thiamine than I had before these data. Um, it does look like the people who are using it, even though they're only 55 in the study, seem to be doing better than average. So that, that's encouraging. And actually, uh, to anyone who wants to know more about vitamins B1, if you visit our YouTube channel, you will see an interview of Daphne Bryan, who has written a book on that topic. So there is a lot of information there. Uh, Gina is asking whether you work with anyone who has had DBS and does it make any difference to the way you approach the patient? No, not at all. I, I refer people to for DBS regularly. I think it's a fabulous, viable, excellent option for a lot of people. Thank you very much. Stephen was uh, quite uh, interested in your comment about L-DOPA helping with pain relief and anxiety. And he's asking whether creatine would be useful in muscle pain. I have not seen it be useful in muscle pain. Um, if you had that experience, I would love to know that. And that's the other thing I'll say is, for those of you who are in the um, MVP study, it, it's a it's a marathon. I get that we ask for you to answer a lot of questions, but down at the end, we have a section that says, is there anything else you want us to know? And that's where people will write things like creatine improved my pain or my sleep or lion's mane improved my sense of smell. And we actually read every one of those and we change the survey so that we can start asking other people, are they noticing that stuff too? So once one or two, once we have a couple of people telling us craniosacral made my drooling go away, right? We're like, hmm, that's interesting. And then we, so, so please know we're working for you. This is your survey. If you have questions like that, let us know. It's really easy for us to go out and start asking them. Heidos Thiamin was not on the survey when it started. Thank you very much, Ari. Uh, Beatrice has an interesting question about asking whether there is any difference between men and women, especially women who face menopause with its own challenges. Um, there is a difference. I don't know. I'm not going to speak to menopause particularly, but women have a slower progression than men. That's good. Very happy for them. <laughs> and on that topic, we basically, we will have a, a session on, on Parkinson's and women towards the end of the year. Uh, I think it's in October, if I remember well. Uh, Andrew is asking whether, uh, having seen that Mukuna can be beneficial on the supplement list, should we reduce our levodopa, pharmaceutical levodopa to take advantage of the Mukuna instead? I don't know that I would reduce it, no, but um, many of you will have an opportunity in the in the future where you, you are taking your meds every four hours, but they're running out after three and a half. And a lot of people will kind of top it off. They'll take a 25100 levodopa with a Makuna and tell me, hey, instead of my meds wearing off at the three and a half hour mark, they're lasting an extra hour now. And so I would say just be patient. If you look at, there are other things that also seemed to be good for you besides Makuna, like exercise and friendship and Brussels sprouts. Like you don't need more pills are not necessarily the solution. 
I would say the next time you find yourself running a little short on meds and considering a dose adjustment up, that might be a good time to, instead of just piling on more pharmaceuticals, mix and match and see if you don't get some benefit by adding some Makuno. Excellent. That's what I do, by the way. Um, someone with initial stage R is asking, uh, having a look at Ginkgo biloba as being the top of the list. Uh, okay, small population of respondents, but very big impact. Right. Uh, is there is is, it, is there anyone who should not be taking it? Um, people with bleeding disorders, there seems to be some research that it might, um, people who are on blood thinners, warfarin, Coumadin, it might increase your risk of bleeds. Um, the, you know, we, we have been using ginkgo for thousands of years as a memory enhancement drug. Um, there has never once, if you go to the PubMed, the medical database and type in ginkgo Parkinson's, a hundred and some studies pop up showing how good the molecules in ginkgo are for neurons in petri dishes, test tubes, and rodents. There has never once been a study where we have given ginkgo to people with Parkinson's, right? So one of the reasons I'm doing this study too is, is to help other researchers get some ideas about where the fish might be biting. Um, and so what I've, I, I, as a complementary and alternative medicine doc for 20 years, I've never given ginkgo. I felt like such a fool when I got these results back. And the, the first, the number one thing on the list is something I haven't been using with my patients. Um, and so lately what I've been telling people, if you don't have a bleeding disorder, it's one extra pill. I found a product that only costs about $17 a month. It's one pill a day. And it's about the dose that they've been using in the Alzheimer's trials. And so I have been making it more available to people, but I'm certainly not pushing it or recommending it. Thank you very much. I have a question here that makes me smile, if not laugh, for Melanie. Let's just take it with tongue in cheek. How do we get the dogs to help us? Are your dogs available? <laughs> um, Maybe around Seattle, we can go for a walk with your dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, if you, every drawer in my house has some dirty Q-tip that somebody from somewhere in the world sent me saying, uh -huh. does this have the scent of Parkinson's? Um, yeah, stay tuned. I mean, this is just a time and resources thing. I've applied for two grants saying, can I turn the dogs into a medical detection device? And both grants have given me a very good score and said, yeah, come back. <laughs> Why don't you have more neurologists on board? It's like, because they're dogs. Dogs are my partner. I don't need, you know, so I'm fixing the, the reviewer feedback. But yeah, I mean, um, within, if we had the money, to build the lab, we could have the dogs up and running in six months. I mean, everyone could send in dirty Q-tips and we could tell you in 10 minutes whether the dog responds yes or no. If we have time, I can show you a three minute video on the dogs. It's pretty cool. Let's keep that for the end. Let's keep that for okay. the end. I also wanted to say that I read very recently that a company has launched a skin test called Sin One that basically has a 95% success rate. So the dogs are great, but it's good to know that there are other technologies available as well that are emerging right now. Uh, the dogs are in order of magnitude. And they're much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> so someone is asking, if we cut all our dairy, do we risk an increase in the risk of osteoporosis? osteoporosis as a, you know, as a, basically that is already a high risk for people with Parkinson's in general. Yeah, um, interestingly, one of the ways I wound up studying what I'm studying is my undergraduate work was in nutrition, and, and I chose as my graduate thesis project bones and calcium, and I thought it would be easy, and it was my first um, wake-up call where I learned the more dairy any country consumes, the higher rates of osteoporosis in that country. Right. And so it is true that dairy has a lot of calcium, but it also has a lot of sulfur containing amino acids that make you pee urinate out your calcium. Mm. So I don't want anyone becoming calcium deficient. Almonds, seaweed, green leafy vegetables, tofus, all packed in calcium carbonate. If you need a calcium supplement, if you're low, you can take one. Um, but I would argue there is no evidence that a person with weak bones can chug dairy and make strong bones. That's not how that works. Good. Thank you very much. Steven is asking actually something which is not so much diet related, but more 
uh, is asking whether it is helpful to give people a diagnosis of PD given the risk that you have of programming the people for knowing that it is irreversible. So they will basically be making it unconsciously irreversible. Ah, uh, who says it's who says it's irreversible? <laughs> no, that's exactly his point. So he basically says, is it helpful to give someone a diagnosis of irreversible disease? Well, actually, it may not be necessarily always impossible to slow it down. I, I mean, I think I understand the question, and and I absolutely believe that pay, physicians telling patients this is irreversible and progressive is hurting them. Yeah. Just like there is a placebo response, there is a nocebo response. If your coach believes there is no way in the world you stand a chance of making the playoffs, there's no way you're going to make the playoffs. Like I would argue at you need your provider to actually believe that this is a modifiable disease. Mm -hmm. And whether that is placebo or brainwashing or manip you you know like I don't again it's I don't care how we get there. All I care about is that you're better next year than you are today. That's exactly that. One step at a time. Andrew is basically telling us that he has changed his diet to an organic plant-based diet. And since then, his dystonia has stopped within two weeks. And that was early November 2019. So he's asking whether he is an outlier or have, or, or have you seen other examples of the same phenomenon? That, it, it, I have more fun going to work than anybody I know. It is fun to hear people talk about their successes all day. It, it, try it. Track your score. Type in the Pro-PD about to change my diet. Do it for a month. Take your score again and see how you, you decide for yourself. Do you feel better or not? Most people say, I'm going to keep going because I feel so much better. So two people are referring to a Helsinki study that I was not aware of with a very difficult word to pronounce. Uh, where basically that study found that uh, people, that there was basically desulfovibrio de bacteria may be responsible for PD. Are you familiar with this? Yeah, there was a study that just came out linking that one bacteria to Parkinson's. Um, but like I said, I, I it, again, no silver bullet. I do not think that of the 5.7 million organisms in the gut, that one is the problem. Right. We, we like I said, we have a paper under review. People with Parkinson's are missing viruses in healthy controls have like two times, three times more viruses in their gut than you guys have. It's not just bacteria. It's fungus. Mm -hmm. It's viral. It's it's inflammatory. Um, so while it would be really awesome if this were just one bug causing all that, that's not where I'm putting my chips. Excellent. Great question from Shelley. Actually, the question that was burning my lips. Uh, what is your experience of fasting? Because you haven't mentioned fasting, and we had Philip, uh, Philip Matthew, uh, sorry, Matthew Phillips a few weeks ago talking to us about fasting and keto diets. Mm -hmm. um, I am a huge fan of intermittent fasting. I ask all my patients to stop eating three hours before bed and to do at least a 12 hour fast every night. So if they go to bed at 10 p.m., stop eating at 7, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., no food. If you can go even a couple hours longer into the morning, awesome. Um, I have not found keto diets to be very sustainable on um, people. I, I already work so hard to prevent people from losing weight. And most people will start losing weight on a keto diet. Um, and my experience is the stress and the weight loss are, are not worth any are, are not worth any benefits I see. Yeah. So I love the science that we're learning from, you know, whether or not ketone esters might be a tool or whether we can kind of go keto-ish and get some benefits. Um, I think we might find that, but I think the science is solid that the body needs a break from food to start encoding DNA differently. I think it's beneficial for other purposes than just Parkinson's for cancer prevention and, and other illnesses. Um, Bernard is asking whether uh, is it possible to have a list of good and bad foods? Now, you have already mentioned it in your slides. Is there another more comprehensive list somewhere, or should we just refer Bernard to the slides of the presentation um, afterwards? Um, yes, and, and there is another list from last year that has a kind of an expanded list of good and bad that I'd be happy to send along that you could post. Thank you very much. Um, so, just looking at some other questions, actually. Uh, yes, uh, someone anonymous was asking about fasting. We answered that, and also asking about high carb diets. I don't know if we heard you on that one. 
Um, high, high what diets? High, high carb, high carb, high, high, high carb, carbohydrates. High carb, yeah. Yes. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know other than sugar. I mean, it's, here's what I'll say about sugar. When I do my annual blood work on my patients with Parkinson's, I measure everybody's hemoglobin A1C and I measure everybody's level of inflammation as a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And if people have high blood sugar, stop everything. I slap a continuous glucose monitor on them. We get their sugar under control as a priority item. Once sugar comes under control, you can watch inflammation come down, right? So there are people for whom I make sugar a really big deal, but I'm going to say 85% of my patients with Parkinson's, sugar is not one of the things we worry about. That's good to know. Jim C was asking about rotigotin, which is a new, a new one for me. Are you familiar with this? I haven't seen it on your list. It's the top of your list of questions. Oh, uh, rotigotin patch um, yes. for dementia is, I assume. Um, yeah, so I think it has potential. So, so for those who don't know, the rotigotin patch has been used in, in Alzheimer's disease to improve cognition. Um, and, and when we started using it in Parkinson's, I don't think anyone was that excited about it because it hasn't been terribly mind-blowingly effective in Alzheimer's. Um, but I actually find it pretty effective in Parkinson's. I, I absolutely think if your doctor is suggesting it, it's worth trying it. Um, I do hear a lot of patients and their partners saying that when they started using it, it did seem to improve cognitive function. So I definitely think it's worth I try. want to keep an eye on. Thank you very much. Someone anonymous, anonymous seems a bit confused about the fact that actually coconut oil was on your list of vitamins and supplements that you were not too confident with, but at the same time, it was on your positive list of foods. Um, what is your view on coconut oil? Is it clearly uh, green? No, it is purely green. It, it made both cuts. It was statistically significant as a supplement, and it is on the short list of foods that seems to be having a beneficial impact. Thank you very much. Donna has a question that is basically uh, goes well together with another question much lower down on the list from someone else. Have you studied the people who claim to have overcome Parkinson's, like a, a guy here called Howard Shark uh, that I don't know? Uh, mm -hmm. Have you looked at specific cases of people who, who basically managed to reduce their symptoms or slow down to, to such a point that it basically feels like they have it totally under control? Yeah, that's and good. The, 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 did it teach yeah, you anything well, else than the, the statistical numbers of the, the bigger population that you've looked at? Um, I have asked all of those people who I, I get emails from people often telling me their stories and I send everyone to the data to join this study. Because what happens is if I hear that Howard reversed Parkinson's, what happens is even if I were to write it up, every neurologist rolls their eyes and says, that's just anecdote. We don't know that that was even Parkinson's. We don't, until they do an autopsy, we don't really know that that's what he has. I mean, there is always a, we don't know. Um, when you start getting into populations, that's where it starts to, I, I mean, I am taking what those people tell me is their secret to success. And I'm studying the population to see if those, yeah. if you, the rest of you do it, does it also work for you too? So I'm learning from them to build this questionnaire. And you want them to be on your on your chart as a little dot on the lower right quadrant together with others as many as possible uh, and that basically leads me to another question that is quite similar which basically donna was asking you if you had included jimmy Choi in your database you know him of course he, he was in one of the pictures i know him i have personally never looked to see if he was in the database and even if i have <laughs> you couldn't tell us i wouldn't tell you so, um, <laughs> So Donna is asking us where to get Mukuna. Well, Abba man online, I don't know. There is no real mystery. Uh, I'm not in the, 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 the work of trying to advertise any products. I don't benefit from any rebate of any kind, but one of the ones that I would probably suggest is a company called Now, N-O-W, simply because they've been FDA approved. And there is a lot of products coming from more exotic countries where I wouldn't be so confident. The one that is approved in India actually has artificial sweetener in it. So the Now brand, um, they did a study where they looked at six different companies taken off of store shelves. And the Now brand was the only brand that had in it what the label said it had in it. Good. That's good to know. Uh, 
Well, there are some questions actually that are a bit more remote, like, is there a link with tinnitus and Parkinson's? I think the answer is yes, but I don't know if you've looked at that. That was one of my symptoms at some point, too. So I'm, I'm quite familiar with it. This is for those who don't know it, is hearing a noise in your head. Um, the link that I am aware of are, are B12 deficiency causes both Parkinsonism and tinnitus, and, B, and magnesium deficiency has been linked to both neurodegeneration and tinnitus. So if a Parkinson's patient presented with tinnitus, I would absolutely treat or work them up for magnesium and B12 deficiencies. Excellent. Thank you very much for the tip. Uh, Shelly was asking us whether vegetable proteins are as bad as animal proteins. I mean, you were telling us earlier that they were not necessarily bad. It's a question of when you take them and how much you take, but uh, would you make a difference between both? Well, you can remember, remember animal products take six to eight times longer to pass through. So if you put a little bit of peanut butter in your morning smoothie, it's plant-based, you've blended it up, it moves through you quickly. It's still, your peanut butter in your smoothie is not still going to be interfering with your meds in a couple hours that you take two hours from now. So people will find that even though hummus has protein in it, they can dip their cucumbers in hummus and not have it interfere with their meds much. And so um, you can play around with what you can get away with. What I have people do is just to find answer the question, is protein interfering? First thing you do is take a couple of days off of protein and just eat super, super, super low protein for two days. And by about day two or three, you know, people's golf game starts getting better. They're standing taller. Their meds are working better. Then you start having a protein meal with dinner. And then you start sneaking a little bit in throughout the day. What about lunch? What, and, and then it becomes a game of what can I get away with? What foods interfere? What don't? Um, but if it doesn't bother you, don't tiptoe around protein. Some people can, can have a big bowl of scrambled eggs and not have it affect their meds at all. Other people have an egg and it messes their meds up for the rest of the day. So experiment. Thank you very, very much. I think we have our questions under control, which is amazing because we have answered more than 50 questions. So Laurie, thank you so much. There is the last question actually from Melanie, who made me laugh earlier with another question. It basically said, please leave us enough time for the dog video. Should we watch it? Yes, hello. Okay. <laughs> How to kill all mosquitoes in the area in 90 seconds. This simple. All right. Let's share the screen. Adjust the commercial. <laughs> oh, but brilliant trick you can do to. Hello, and welcome to the Park 9 testing facility. We've spent the past few months training dogs to identify the scent of Parkinson's disease. The purpose of this video is to demonstrate how we have the track set up and to show the viewer how the dogs signal a positive sample when they find it. I've circled the container with the true scent of Parkinson's disease, which I'll show briefly before bringing the dogs out for each of the rounds. In these first couple examples, all the containers are empty except for a single container that has cotton-tipped swabs from the ears of individuals with Parkinson's. This is our six-month-old Lagoda Romagnolo, Reese. Here comes our two-year-old Vigoto Romagnolo, Coco. She fails miserably at walking the track, but has no problem identifying the sample. In this second video, I'm blinded to the contents of the containers. This round is more difficult for the dogs because there are no multiple samples from Parkinson's patients hidden among samples from healthy controls. There's a lot we don't know. We don't know what it is the dogs are smelling. We don't know if they can distinguish between idiopathic Parkinson's disease and other forms of Parkinsonism. And most importantly, we don't know how early in the disease the dogs can detect the scent. Currently, Parkinson's disease is diagnosed by neurologists 10, 20 years after the disease has already started. A tool that would enable early detection could revolutionize Parkinson's disease diagnosis and management. Our goal is to convert these dogs into the next generation of medical detection devices. That was amazing. Laurie, thank you so much. Thank you. We're ending up on a high note, which basically Perfect. shows us that the man's best friend is really the man's best friend. So thank you so much for today. I think that actually you really had a clear message of uh, hope and encouragement that we are the boss. We can make decisions. 
about the way we exercise or we don't exercise, what we eat, the red or the green list, um, the way we socialize and, and many other things. Uh, so we are very much more in control than so we are sometimes told when we are diagnosed. So thank you so much for that. And thank, thank you, you for, for your the time. Thank you for the invitation. To our audience, I would like to say that please make a note in your diaries that our next session is provisionally due to take place on Monday, the 5th of June, and we will have the pleasure of hosting a presentation by Dr. Peter Tass from Stanford Medicine on the use of vibrating gloves. So I do expect a lot of you to join us on that day. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you to our audience and good night, everyone. Hey, Ruth.